Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hello, Ryan. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I was like looking down at the script for my next line. I'm like, wait a minute. I just say hello to you. you no, know? Yeah, like I don't, and in fact, I don't even write uh, say hello to Kiernan in the script. I always yeah. assume that that's going to come naturally. It, this time it was a little off. I'm like, shit, what happens next? You I know? feel like people are probably shocked that there's any sort of <laughs> <laughs> in the script, um, but also they're probably not shocked that there is one, and you don't read it until we're actually on air. Well, that's how I keep so fresh, you know. <laughs> well, Ryan, speaking of fresh, uh, when you go to a restaurant, you want fresh food. No, Ryan, I believe that uh, today we actually have a, a special interview that you did. Uh, who'd you talk to? We talked to uh, Bao Ung, who's the food and drink editor of Time Out, about what makes a great restaurant, trends that he's seen in, in restaurants, and some of his favorite restaurants in New York and beyond. So it's a, it's a very fun conversation, and it will make you very hungry. And uh, is it mostly food focused? Mostly, uh, do you get into ambiance and decor? We we talk a, a little bit about ambiance and decor, but but basically, uh, we're, we're talking about food and what makes really good food and what makes a restaurant that that uh, you know you want to go back to. Because uh, so much of dining these days uh, in the, in the press is like these fancy restaurants that are super fine dining or expensive. Um, you know, those are not places that you return on like a a, a, a weekly or monthly basis. Uh, so we're, we're, we're kind of getting to the bottom of what are the, what are those kind of restaurants? Fantastic. Uh, well, I look forward to listening to it. Um, and actually, I, I would like to uh, talk just for a moment about a guest that we're going to have on in November, because I actually need uh, some listener input here. Whoa. Um, so there's a new uh, travel advice column in the New York Times. It's called Tripped Up. So it's by a uh, travel journalist named Sarah Fershin. And uh, she's going to come on. And the premise of it uh, is very specific. So th the idea is that she wants to hear from listeners your biggest travel disasters. And then she's going to give sort of advice back to the broader travel community to help them avoid, uh, you know, what, 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 what the circumstances that cause that to be a disaster for you. So, you know, an example that I would point to, Ryan, is maybe we could ask her about when you went to Brazil uh, without a travel visa. And if you haven't right. heard that story, you got to go back a couple episodes, travel visas, uh, one of the classics. Yeah. My mom loved that story, by the way. She, she flagged it as, <laughs> she's like, I, you know, you didn't take me on a trip, but you did didn't she, go to Brazil. You know, did she know about that yet? Uh, she didn't know like all the details, you yeah. know? Uh, I mean, it's yeah. pretty shocking. Yeah, it's it, pretty it, shocking. it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you hear the uh, total amount of money that you lost. <laughs> Look, I am glad that at 37, I can still still shock my mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, you can lie about being a couple years younger than you actually are. <laughs> oh, uh, that is not fair. Um, Check the Wikipedia, folks. And so what we need for Sarah Fershine is we would like to hear from our listeners the biggest travel disasters that you have had uh, in, in in traveling around, it could be it could be small trips, day trips, you know, and, or it could be vast overseas uh, 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 conundrums like uh, what happened with Ryan when he had two doors to go through, people with visas or people transferring <laughs> flights, and he had neither. Um, and so, just I I thought I'd maybe read to you exactly what uh, Tripped Up uh, describes itself as. Uh, Sarah writes, "I will help Times readers get restitution for their thorniest travel misadventures." while providing tips and takeaways that steer onlurkers away from the same fate. So we're asking listeners to email us at outofofficepod at gmail.com and uh, give us your travel disasters. We'll address a few of them with Sarah. And uh, who knows, maybe she'll source some for the Times. And you could also uh, slide into our Instagram at OOO podcast to send us those disasters as well. That's right. So the Instagram handle yeah. actually different than that Gmail handle, I've yeah. noticed. Very good. Good, solid branding. Excellent branding. <laughs> so uh, if it's Instagram, OOO podcast, like, ooh, podcast. But yeah. And slide into our DMs, which means yeah, disaster, you slip disaster in, messages. You got to slip <laughs> into those DMs. And uh, you're right, though. I should post it on Instagram to get some uh, feedback on there as well. And uh, if it's email, outofofficepod at gmail.com. So we will have that coming in just a couple weeks. Um, now, Ryan, we also have... Uh, a bit more of housekeeping here. And, you know, I hate to say it. We need a recalculating. It's time to recalculate. Recalculating. Now, Ryan, you know what recalculating is, right? It is. It's, it's generally uh, when you've made a mistake 
and no, we correct no, it. No, but no, this no. time it's not that. This time it's not that. No, it is that. <laughs> well, yeah, it's that plus me just giving air to listeners some yeah, tidbits it's, about it's, our past it, guests. What it really is more about is uh, it's it's uh, so recalculating is when we revisit a topic that we've talked about in the past. Sometimes that's to correct for a mistake. Sometimes it's to give a little more context. Sometimes it's a follow up. And, um, you know, nine times out of 10, it's about wow air <laughs> and, uh, true to form. You ever feel like sometimes this podcast is just Peru, Iceland and wow air. I, I, I mostly do. Yeah. 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 So um, with a little Mexico city thrown in. So, uh, last week, my, uh, my last stop was a, a great podcast episode about the rise and fall and, and resurrection of, yeah. uh, of wow air to, to clarify the, the. Your last stop was a recommendation to listen to another podcast that was great. Yeah, we, yeah, didn't, we didn't do anything great. I'm, suppo- I'm supporting the podcast right. community, yeah. and it was for a it was for a Planet Money spinoff, The Indicator, and and uh, it's in the show notes if you go back there. But um, I had asserted something that apparently confused some listeners, which was uh, I said, uh, Ryan, you, do you remember um, in in 2010? There was a huge uh, explosion and a, a volcano of course, going of course. off in Iceland that grounded planes all over the world. Yeah, it was it was a really big deal. It was a huge deal. Yeah, and it, it's got a crazy name. Um, I will attempt to say it now. Uh, You're um, always messing up these foreign names. I'm, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's really my segment there. Um, I mean, this one is probably the hardest word anyone could ever have to say. It's called A Ya Fya La Yo Cool. I mean, it's pronounced. It's spelled. E Y J A F J A L L A J O K U L L. So, you know, I mean, give me, give me a little credit here for even attempting it. But basically in 2010, that volcano in Iceland exploded and it sent up thick, uh, uh, dense, uh, ash clouds and it grounded planes between the U S and Europe. And it, and it was a huge deal of people just travel disasters. Somebody might write that in, <laughs> um, <laughs> for the tripped yeah. up column. And, um, what I said was it, 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 uh, the podcast mentions that it was this uh, volcano explosion that actually created the explosion in tourism and the rise of wow air, uh, in Iceland. Um, but, but I, I understand there was confusion as to, well, why would, a a, a, a giant volcano that grounded planes be, uh, the reason for success in the tourism industry in Iceland. But that's, what's so fascinating in it is that uh, Iceland basically had two uh, catastrophes happen in very close proximity. In 2008, um, they had the giant financial crisis um, because they were uh, very heavily into into banking and financial investment, uh, and this like very you know relatively small economy w- had outsized impact in the in the global markets. Right. So that financial crash was one disaster, and then you had this volcano exploding. But what that meant was that journalists from all over the world. We're going to Iceland uh, to report, to talk to people. And what were they showing while they were there? Well, they were revealing these amazing landscapes, the, the drive that you could do, the, the charming city Reykjavik. And by dint of that, uh, it started to get on, on the tourism map. Um, really? Yeah. That's exa- and so you saw Wow Air suddenly see this huge increase in, in bookings. And that's really these two disasters created kind of the next uh, uh, mainstay of Iceland's economy, which is tourism. So is Iceland just crossing their fingers for another uh, <laughs> volcano eruption? I, I mean, I have to think that they are. Yeah, they're, I, I mean. All they need is a lot of baking soda and some vinegar. I mean, you, you drop that stuff down in the, in the you, can, you can just make your own. Oh, I, I mean, you can't tell if they're crossing their fingers because their mittens are so thick. I right. mean, it is a cold place. Um, but I thought I would uh, quickly quote. So the, the New York Times did a did a um, some journalism on this saying uh, about this trend about how disaster led to the uh, tourism boom, and uh, they actually uh, spoke to the proprietor of what's called Hotel Ranga, which is this uh, kind of luxury hotel that I stayed in last year when I when I went to Iceland. They have their own little um, uh, um, observatory, so if you get a clear night, you can see amazing stars there. And uh, this owner, whose name is Frederick Paulson, said, Iceland has been saved by the crash and the eruption. I have never seen anything take off so fast. So, uh, you know, right there on the ground, you got hotel owners, restaurateurs, and, and Wow Air um, confirming uh, that, that those two disasters, you know, in disaster can be uh, uh, opportunity. Hey, look, and, as, fact, as Rahm Emanuel once said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Didn't somebody said that before him? Somebody uh, like really famous said that. What is Rama Emanuel not not no, famous I feel like, enough? Like,
you know, I, I think that was Winston Churchill and, you know, Rahm and Winston. I, I might credit Winston first before Rahm I would, Emanuel. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. Winston's a little, you know, better known for his phrasing. He also had all his fingers, so. <laughs> what? Isn't Rom missing a finger? I have no idea. I've never shook yeah, the man's sure hand. Yeah, pretty sure Is that why he always wears those mittens? I thought it was just he was an Icelandic. Thought... <laughs> Jeez. Uh, severely cut his right middle finger on a meat slicer. Yeah. That must have really limited the way that, that he could communicate because his middle fingers are his, his most powerful Oh, it's kind of his trademark. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, Ryan. Well, uh, listen, we, we've talked about, uh, we've talked about how we're sourcing, uh, travel disasters. And then we've talked about how, uh, in disaster can be great opportunities. And Ryan, I believe, uh, you know, it seems that you also have a recalculating if I, if I'm not incorrect. Yeah, I have a couple. Should uh, we play the sound effect again? <laughs> I, I, we've never done a double recalculating. Well, I think this is a good time to do some, you know, do some quick housekeeping. Uh, I'll, Friend of the pod, uh, Walter De Leon, reached out to us to let us know that in the episode we did a uh, Mexico City Part Dos, mm -hmm. we said that uh, San Francisco had the only other little Tokyo That's in North right. America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were wrong. Mm. I, for what it's worth, I do think I said that. Yeah. yeah. I, well, uh, yeah. Yes. I, I appreciate to, you saying we and taking right. ownership alongside with me. Now, the other two are in uh, San Jose. Mm. and los angeles mm. yeah mm. so uh, thank you walter for for sending that along and uh also if you didn't notice the new york times after we uh, did that whole episode talking about uh mexico city's uh, little tokyo was nice enough to follow up with uh, the the same piece so i i did i did yeah. see that and uh i'll tell you that uh somebody reached out to me and said i've noticed that uh the times is occasionally following up on topics you guys tackle i wouldn't be surprised if a journalist is sourcing ideas and uh, if that's so, hey, you know, our dance card's open. I come on uh, onto the podcast. We can, give, we can give you a million ideas. Heck, we can start <laughs> writing. We could be the official podcast of the New York Times travel section. I, I, you know, we are totally open to that, although we're in talks with the Washington Post as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then one, uh, one last other quick thing to mention. Uh, one of our crazy popular episodes a few <laughs> weeks ago was on what is the big deal with escape rooms um, with uh, Tommy Wallach. And he talked a bit about how he was working on a new escape room that was going to be uh, fully replayable, the first ever replayable escape room where there are multiple sort of narratives that you can follow. Uh, and they have announced uh, this. It's called The Ladder. And the Kickstarter is, has been out for about a week. Um, and we'll link to it in the show notes. But it is a very, very cool thing. Uh, it's going to be opening uh, later next year. And you can read all about it on the Kickstarter and uh, always watching out what they're doing there at Hatch Escapes in, uh, in Los Angeles. Awesome, awesome company, friends of the pod. And we will put it in the show notes. Totally. And I think, uh, I think that's all the recalculating we have time for because we got to go uh, take off and chat with Val about food. Tell the cabin crew. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. Welcome, Val Ung from uh, Time Out New York, food and drink editor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So before we jump in and talk about what makes a great restaurant and uh, some of the great restaurants here in New York, well, I know you've had to eat a lot in the last six months. You know, following uh, Bao on Instagram is just a way to be the most jealous of anyone's, uh, you know, uh, Bao has a great, I don't know how you stay so thin. You know, there must be a secret that, that I'm not aware of. Uh, but if I ate as, as, as wonderfully as you uh, every day, I think it would be, you know, I wouldn't look as good, Bao. You know, uh, just, just flagging that. Just taste. <laughs> Small bites. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know when you and I were at were at, were at Missy a few months ago, we it was it was small bites, the four four yeah, plates. Everything pasta. though, I also <laughs> clean my plate. Um, well, okay, so let's talk a bit about what makes a great restaurant. So when you're thinking about writing a review of a restaurant or building a list of great restaurants in the city, what are some of the things that you're looking for? I'd have to say, first of all, how a restaurant is judged, how we measure a restaurant is so subjective. But for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always asking, asking myself, you know, is this a place that I would come back to um, in a city like New York where you could eat at two, three different new restaurants every night uh, for someone to go back to a restaurant says a lot. Um, so, you know, I'm always looking for a place that, you know, has some personality, that has a good atmosphere and is a place that I can go to as easily on a Monday night as well as on a Saturday. Those are the type of places that I'm most interested in and the type of places that I try to write about as well. 
And do you think that like New York and other big cities are trending more to like this kind of more exclusive, occasional fine dining atmosphere than than these really good, you know, neighborhood places? I think I think of a place in my neighborhood, La Grage, right, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. Uh, a little French bistro here in Bushwick, and and I eat there I don't know, once a week probably. Mm-hmm. Um, it just seems like the city doesn't have as many of those kind of places as it used to. It seems like like sort of fine dining has crept in everywhere. It has. Um... No, I, I would agree with you. Uh, you know, running a restaurant in New York is a very expensive proposition. Um, I would never do it myself. The profit margins are slim at best, um, even more so the higher end the restaurant. Um, really? So the higher end the restaurant, the, the lower the, the profit margins? Exactly. Um, that's why the Olive Garden does so well or the right. Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Uh, but when you're you mean, you, you mean I have to stress out for La Bernardine? You don't think they're they're making a making bank over there? Uh, they're not as making. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're fine, but um, you know, their <laughs> profit margins are not anywhere near some of these bigger box restaurants. Um, you know, when you're when you're you know when you're running a restaurant like La Bernardine or Per Se, you know, you have expensive ingredients. You have a lot of staff. Uh, your rent's really expensive, and I think um, a lot of it does come down to rent. For New York restaurants, uh, it's increased so much that you can't find those neighborhood spots that you could that you can be a regular at. Um, so you f- do find places that are quite good, where the food looks like it might be, you know, from a f- chef with a fine dining background. Uh, but oftentimes, still, so those aren't the prices that you can go to for most of us, anyhow, can go to every day. So a, a lot of restaurant criticism, if we're looking at the James Beard Awards or, or Michelin uh, or, or, or these folks, um, they're not necessarily taking into account the, the, price, the prices, right? Like uh, if you have a place with two or three Michelin stars, that's probably going to be a pretty expensive place. Exactly. Yeah. Especially for Michelin where they have certain standards that they're judging a restaurant by. Um, you know, those are definitely the pricier restaurants. Uh, but, you know, the Michelin also produces the, the Bib Gourmand list, which, you know, tries to recognize restaurants that are more approachable. Um, but, you know, they're, they're judged by a different standard as well. So what other trends are you seeing emerge? So there's, there's a, a trend towards maybe more regional uh, examples of, of, of foods that we all know and love. Um, are there any other trends that you're seeing in, in, in these restaurants? I think uh, diners are really demanding more uh, plant-based options. You know, I think it would be a stretch to say, you know, oh, everyone wants to be a vegan or vegetarian. Um, that's not the case, but I think people who go out in New York, they don't, they want something more than steak and potatoes. Um, you know, for example, at Via Carota, there's this huge towering, you know, green salad. It doesn't look like anything special, but it's like one of the most popular dishes on the menu at Via Carota, which is you know, another hot restaurant in New York at the moment. Um, if you go to uh, oh no, Superiority Burger, you know, which is all vegetarian from a former chef at uh, Del Posto. He opened this tiny spot in the East Village. The burger is uh, vegetarian friendly. All the sides are, even the desserts. And it's, you know, definitely one of the most popular spots in the East Village at the moment. And do you think that's something that's like New York specific or do you imagine that there that, that more vegetarian options? I mean, you know, I'm, it's something that I've also noticed that there just happens to be way more vegetarian and, and even vegan options on menus that wouldn't, you know, from restaurants you wouldn't expect to see like a lot of those options. Because it used to be when you went out to eat with like a friend who was vegetarian or vegan, it involved like a lot of planning, you know? Yeah. Um, but that seems to have changed in New York in the last couple of years. And I guess, is that something that we think we're seeing other places? I think so. Um, you know. Um, for a number of different reasons. You know, this whole uh, wellness and health movement that's, you know, very trendy with, like, goop and, I don't know, CBD oil or something like that. Um, I I think uh, Americans in general are thinking about that more. But also, you know, I think people are more interested in uh, meat alternatives, and that's why we're seeing the rise of, you know, impossible meat and uh, beyond meat. And you'll, and you'll see that at restaurants across the country and even the bigger chain restaurants are implementing it on their menus. Yeah, I think I've seen, like, doesn't Burger King have a no meat burger now? I I wouldn't be sur- yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, so, uh, so talk a little bit about, so you, this list that you built for, for Time Out, the, the 100 Eat list, 
it includes a lot of restaurants that are not on the Michelin list, that are not on the James Beard list. Mm -hmm. um, what were you trying to do there? Like what, 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 what do you, is there something you're trying to say about, about dining or uh, uh, is, is, do you think that these, there's these, all these amazing restaurants in New York that are just not getting the kind of coverage they deserve? Uh, I, well, I definitely think that's true. There, there are so many restaurants in New York that are not being covered uh, that I think, you know, readers would, you know, would love to know about. Uh, but also, I think when you look at a lot of these best restaurant lists that get published and that are focused on New York, a lot of times these restaurants are the, you know, the two and three Michelin star places, the places that the New York Times loves. Um, and I love eating at those restaurants. Those restaurants provide amazing experiences. Uh, but I think for too long, um, you know, these lists often featured uh, restaurants that came from a very kind of Eurocentric point of view. Um, that if you were to be a restaurant with two or three mission stars or, you know, a, a four star rating from the Times, um, there would be a white tablecloth. You're spending, you know, you're dropping a few hundred bucks uh, just for dinner. And I don't think uh, that's how most of us eat. Um, just as we were saying earlier, you know, like, you know, I don't want to eat at 11 Madison Park once a week. <laughs> maybe, you know. Hey, maybe once, once a week. Maybe, <laughs> maybe once a week, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll join you if uh, you're picking up a tab there. But, um, you know, I think New Yorkers, we're, you know, we're looking for more of those spots where, where you can be a regular. Because at the end of the day, you know, restaurants depend on regulars, first of all. And, too, you know, like, we want a spot that, you know, that you, where you know what you're getting uh, on each visit. And um, so when I'm coming, when, you know, my colleague and I were coming up with this list, you know, we wanted a, a mix of cuisines and price points. Um, you know, not everything is, uh, you know, would be on a so-called cheap eats list. But, um, you know, we wanted uh, a greater uh, range of restaurants on our list that did not include the fine dining spots. So... So you're coming up with a list of, of 100 restaurants, and regardless of what city you're doing this in, I, I imagine the process is similar. Do you start with like a brainstorm of 300? Like, how, how do you even begin to come up with this list? Uh, it's, you know, I've, I've been doing this for a decade, so, um, so it's not as if, and these are not all new restaurants. Some of these restaurants right. have been around um, for years. And uh, so I've been, you know, I've been doing this for about a decade, and I eat out. I would say at least a minimum of four times a week. It ends up being five to six nights a week. And part of that is just being a New Yorker. You know, we just, you know, everyone lives in shoeboxes. So when you meet up, you go out to eat. So right. um, that's not, so I, so it kind of feels natural for the most part. Um, but, you know, so we're constantly eating out at the new places to make sure, you know, that we're on top of trends and, you know, you know, finding, new chefs that are doing exciting things um but trying to visit you know the classics and trying to get further out into queens or even in the bronx for example there's a vietnamese restaurant that's great out there that's included in our, in our eat list um you know and maybe you know and we have so many more places that we still haven't been to um so i just hope that we're giving readers a good sample of what's out there was there anything that surprised you when putting this list together? Uh, any, any restaurants that made the list you didn't expect? Any kinds of food that, you, you know, would be unusual to see on a, kind of a list like this? Um, you know, there's uh, one of the new places that opened uh, this year. Um, I was really surprised by. Um, it's French-Japanese. Uh, it's called Maison Yaki. The French yakitori is the theme there. Oh, uh, that's in Brooklyn, right? Yes, yeah. The chef Greg Baxter has this hugely popular place, uh, Olmsted, across the yeah. street. Yeah, I mean Olmsted. I Olmsted's brunch, I think, is as close to heaven as I'll ever get. <laughs> I, I've never even experienced it because it, it's a, almost impossible to go to Olmsted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've I've gotten in by sheer sheer luck or force of will, a combination of the two things. Um, but yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I only went to Olmsted. Um, early on before all the reviews hit like a few years ago. And that's the only time I've been there. Uh, and it's been hugely popular, but he opened Maison Yaki um, in late spring of this year and everything's $9 or under. 
um, even the drinks. I don't know how that works, but uh, the two times I've been there, it's been packed. Um, the food's fun. It's exciting. Uh, it's very approachable. Um, it's very uh, communal uh, in the you know the dining experience, which I think is also more 2019. Um, it's not formal in any way. What other uh, what what are some other new restaurants that you sort of discovered when you were putting this list together? Uh, ooh, new for this year, uh, Crown Chai. Um, you know, who would have thought that you could have you know a hip restaurant uh, in the financial district? Um, but this team does a really good job. The chef uh, worked at Eleven Madison Park for years. Uh, his business partner. Um, comes from Del Posto, but so you're getting, you know, really uh, refined cooking uh, in the kitchen. Uh, but, you know, there's no white tablecloth, there's fun music. Uh, the servers wear, you know, white t-shirts and jeans. Um, you know, the, they, they paid a lot of attention to the, the interior design. So it just feels very relaxed. Um, you know, there's good energy in the room. And, uh, you know, I, and again, the prices are much more approachable. Uh, you're not dropping you know a thousand dollars for dinner for two people like you would at Love in Madison Park, for example. Um, at Crown Shy, I think the most expensive entree, which feeds two people, is you know only slightly over thirty dollars, but everything is twenty five dollars or under. Are there is there anything that you wish you were seeing in the New York dining scene that that you're not seeing? You know, I've noticed I was just in Dallas recently. And I checked out a restaurant uh, on Bon Appetit's top 10 list. Uh, it's this small Laotian restaurant. And the, the, bowls, are, the bowls of noodles are tiny. Um, they're, you know, barely one serving. They're, they're like the size of a cereal bowl, essentially, that you would eat cereal of. But they had all these different soups, and they were like $5 each. Um, and everything was so, you know, amazing. Like, it was so flavorful. Um, you know, and just like dishes that I haven't seen before, uh, especially in New York. Uh, I know there there is a Laotian place that's quite good, uh, Keo in Tribeca. Uh, higher, definitely a higher price point. The chef is very talented, does great work, but um, I haven't seen much Laotian food in New York. And um, there's a great uh, Laotian community in Long Beach. Just uh, you know, that's basically LA. Um, and I was really impressed by all the the ocean food there. Um, there are a number of places in the Bay Area. Uh, so I don't think that part of Southeast Asia has had much of a spotlight in New York, and I'd love to see more of that. Maybe the closest to that would be um, this Thai restaurant in uh, Elmhurst, uh, which is also on our e list. It's uh, is it number 15 or 16, uh, Pada Papian. It's this, it looks like it's a bar that you would find in Bangkok. Um, but they only serve noodles there during the weekends. And these bowls are also very small, you know, so it's kind of uh, mimicking what you would find um, in terms of street food uh, in Thailand. And, you know, for $5, you, you know, you kind of pick your bowl of soup. Uh, they usually have only like three choices. You know, you pick your noodles, the broth you want. And, you know, for $5, you can't beat know what they're serving yeah i i think the one thing i really have to focus on is exploring you know i I've, I've obviously eaten out a ton in brooklyn and manhattan but my exploring of queens is not that impressive from a food standpoint you know i haven't really and i know that queens is you know i've even talked about it on this on this podcast before queens is one of the most diverse places mm -hmm. on earth one of the most languages uh yeah, spoken for jackson capital. heights yeah yeah so the food scene there is outrageous. I mean, there's just so much, there's just so much to taste, taste. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, it, I need to go out there and do like a, a food tour. Maybe I'll pull up your list and start going through things. Hey, I'm always up for a food crawl in Queens. There's a lot to explore. <laughs> and before we, before we jump, I'd love to just hear your thoughts. I, I know that you're very well traveled, that you've eaten around, uh, all around the world quite a bit. Uh, are there any kind of restaurants that, that you think are a little below the radar that you could, you could flag for our listeners? Outside of the U.S., uh, I was just uh, Spain over the summer. Uh, oh, I was so jealous of that trip. That seemed like a ton of fun. Yeah, I know. And, uh, and I was really impressed by all the great wine 
we have that very affordable prices. Um, I know that you're, you know, that you know a lot about natural wines. And I wouldn't say that, that I know a lot about natural wine. I just, I, know, I, just, I know very little. But, I enjoy um, drinking it a lot. Yeah. But it's not, uh, it's, you know, you're, you're, it's definitely more of an investment um, in the U.S. when you're trying to buy, you know, these natural bottles uh, of wine. And right. in Spain, it was, you get one for, you know, 12 U.S. dollars. And I bet it was like, it's like fantastic. Like, right, yeah, right, it was right. Just fun. Yeah. And, you just, yeah. and it's just at a price point where you can taste a lot of different bottles. And uh, it's, you, you're from the Twin Cities, right? Is there any, any, yeah. anything you give a shout out to uh, there? Uh, well, I think Gavin Tyson, who uh, is a Minnesotan who worked in New York City for years uh, with Danielle Balud, he moved back maybe five, six years ago. And I think he's really energized. Uh, the restaurant scene in the Twin Cities, um, which I think is uh, definitely underrated. Um, last uh, year, I ate um, at a restaurant in St. Paul called In Bloom that I was really impressed by. It's in this market called Keg and Case. Um, a lot of it's open fire cooking, um, a lot of uh, meats on the menu, um, very kind of northern minnesota uh, a little bit of some of that scandy influence as well um yeah i haven't been back in the last year uh, to the twin cities but um i think there, there's a lot of great restaurants there well awesome you have given us a lot to think about um and i uh, appreciate your time uh so thank you thank you bao uh from time out and uh, we will make sure to link to a bunch of these restaurants in the show notes uh, as well as the big uh, Eat 100 list. So thank you so much. Thank you. And now it's time for the last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. All right, Ryan. Killer interview. Fantastic. Are there any, uh, is there any ethnic food in, in Boston that doesn't exist in other cities? Maybe like, like some really intense Irish you know, meat dish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like what would it what would it even be like a like a porridge like a well uh, <laughs> rabbit <well>. porridge <laughs> maybe it's just like they take Guinness and then they boil it and they add <laughs> potatoes. like <laughs> potatoes and that's the called a Boston soup and and an Englishman's ear yeah. um, <laughs> are there English English in Boston too Gosh. no no because you cut off the uh, ear because oh, they're yeah, the yeah. enemy yeah. God, a boiled Guinness and potatoes doesn't sound so bad. A little carby. Ryan, I feel like you're always driving me back to Peru. Uh, one of the most interesting specialties that you can find in Boston is uh, a restaurant called Ruka, R-U-K-A. And it is the uh, it is uh, Japanese-Peruvian food. If you go back to some of the Peru episodes, <laughs> who knows which one? I think, it's, I think it's Peru part one. I talk about how many surprising cuisines there are in Peru. There's, there's Chinese Peruvian, there's Japanese Peruvian. And I was shocked to find that there is this amazing Japanese Peruvian restaurant, uh, right, right. It's a block from Boston common. And, uh, yeah, so that's one of the great specialties that you can find here. But I, you know, as, to your point, it is one of the most fun things, uh, when you're traveling to a city to not just go to kind of the biggest, best, most famous restaurants, but to find the, the surprising regional specialties. So for example, I spend a lot of time up in Detroit for the day job and, uh, fantastic Lebanese food. Uh, and, and I'm always, I always make sure to get it when I'm, particularly when I'm in Dearborn, which is uh, right outside Detroit. Yeah, that, same thing with me when I'm in D.C. Uh, D.C. has uh, an, uh, a really lively and exciting Ethiopian population, has amazing Ethiopian food in D.C. So um, it's always good to find, to find those little things, I agree. Well, thank you very much to Bao, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. But, Ryan, we are here in the last stop. This is the, the last segment of the show. It's my favorite segment. It's your favorite segment. It's popularly known as the People's Segment. And this is where you and I each take uh, a moment. Uh, it's, it, it, we, we, we think, we contemplate, and we share one thing from the past week that maybe we, we read or we cooked or we saw or we touched or, or, or we smelt, something that evoked what, it, what it's like to get out there and travel, to explore the world. It, you know, something that fed that spirit of wanderlust within us even during the workaday week. So uh, as always, I've got to ask this question, Ryan. Did you bring a last stop this week? I, I brought a last stop that shouldn't be a stop at all. You hmm. know, uh, that's what I brought. So we, we've talked a lot about over-tourism in the show. We've done whole episodes on this. Uh, so there's this kind of bad movie that came out, uh, this, 
sort of derivative bad movie that came out a few weeks ago uh, called Joker. Have you have you heard about this thing? I, I have heard about it. Yeah. And I've and a, I've lived I've lived in total fear since. Yeah, it's it's not good. It's a hit. Which you know, it only goes to show Is it you. Not it's good. Not, I didn't realize it wasn't. Oh good. no, it's definitely not good. Yeah, I've heard uh, very fact, split things. The more the more that I've thought about it, the more I I, I sort of actively hate it. It's become my. like the, my the movie I actively hate this year. Wow. Um, yeah. So, regardless of the quality of the movie, which is low, if you <laughs> if you um, uh, there's a scene that is also not a very good scene where the Joker for, for no reason uh, dances down um, uh, some stairs. stairs, right? Yeah. Yes. And it's sort of yeah. a common, I haven't even quote, seen unquote, it and I know that. Uh, yeah. It's a quote unquote iconic scene by people who don't know enough to know what iconic scene is supposed to be. Wow. And, you are coming out swinging. Oh, oh, oh I hate this movie. And so uh, of course the people who like this movie are, are going to flock to the staircase so they can dress mm. as the Joker yeah. and then dance down the staircase. And uh. so, there's yeah. basically uh, these poor residents in the Bronx, uh, in their like in their apartment complex now, have just a bunch of just sad white men uh, in bad Joker <laughs> costumes dancing down the stairs, taking like Instagram photos or TikTok, whatever they're doing. Um, and it is it is, the, the residents are like, we live here, sure. uh, we we need to use these stairs for functional reasons. It's not just meant for you to like have your childish fantasies on our staircase. So. Um, <laughs> If, I don't know if I haven't been harsh enough, folks. Sorry if anyone, I know, hope no one who listens to this podcast has danced down these stairs as a joker, I promise you. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, but, it's, a, it's a fascinating idea, this question of uh, the, the downside of being featured as a set yeah. in, in a film. I actually know a family that was approached to have the exterior of their building be Carrie Bradshaw's apartment in Sex and the City. And they said no, because they knew that it would eventually become, uh, you know, if the show was a big hit, a, a tour stop. And indeed for many years, there was the sex in the city tour where you would go right. to all the random places and it would be a nightmare. Well, there is a, uh, it, it, my, my friend lives in the, in Greenwich village and he lives down the street from the uh, facade used uh, to film friends. Mm. So it was only in the opening shots. It was just, right, like, right. and to this day, uh, there are just people clumped morning, noon and night, uh, taking pictures of this building, just, you know, and this otherwise sort of quiet street just has like 50 people always at one time just taking pictures of the, the friends. Uh, <laughs> thing. Uh, so, yeah, not a fan of this, uh, this staircase thing. Although, you know, I did, uh, I have to admit, I did when I was younger, I threw myself down the exorcist staircase in Georgetown just because I thought it would be so much fun. <laughs> Um, but that, you know, I was 30 years after the fact. So, you know, yeah, I gotta say there's nothing that really thrills me about being in a place where something was shot. I, I don't know. It seems very lame to me. Well, it's a it's weird a, kind of tourism. The one exception, it's, it's not for a me, New Yorker kind of tourism, right? Cause if you're a New Yorker, every, every yeah, corner is every like, spot, a, in, right, every right. spot has been, yeah. Uh, like yeah. how many Woody Allen films were, you know, 10 Woody Allen films featured <laughs> this street corner. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, the one exception for me would be, uh, and I'm going to ask you this question, so get prepared. I think the one exception for me would be uh, Star Wars. I, I would go out and, and I would love to go where uh, certain you know places was in Star in, Wars in, were in shot. A, yeah, A soundstage with, with a bunch of no, planes No, no, that's not stuff. true. When they do kind of the vast desert planet of Tatooine, yeah. that's in the Tunisian desert. We've talked about the forest that they raced through before. Yeah, uh, we've talked about California. the forest. Yeah. And so I think that's that might be the one exception to yeah. where I would be. Uh, Are you and then sure? I would love to visit the Death Star. I don't know where they shot that, um, presumably up in orbit somewhere and if you want to learn about that go back to our space tourism episode and are you are you sure that you wouldn't go on like a lord of the rings new zealand tour you wouldn't want to go see hobbit land and hobbit world uh you know hobbit, hobbit lord, gardens lord of the rings is not that that's not really my bag honestly uh you're, it's you're, not you're, my baggins if you will oh man <laughs> brutal pretty brutal is there any movie that you feel you would want to travel to to the the where it was set where it was shot i mean look i've already been to like the diner where they shot goodfellas where uh he finds out that joe pesci's been murdered and he mm. runs out and he takes i you know i've so i've already done my one thing yeah, I, don't know, yeah. I don't know what else there is the um, other one in new york's got to be the seinfeld diner that we all know on the upper yeah, west side yeah. and i've walked by that uh, sure. a bunch yeah but it, the interior is different you know yeah, it's not, it's it's not actually different. the yeah these are all before people shot television actually in new york they were just like <laughs> New York is great for exterior shots, but you can't actually film there. You know? Right. And here we yeah. are in lovely Toronto. And here we are now with uh, the Joker dancing down the Bronx stairs. So we have come a long way. You know? That's right. But film is back, ruining yeah. New York. I would love to see Jerry Seinfeld dance down those stairs. <laughs> Something tells me he's not going to do that unless he's in some sort of vintage car driving down it. <laughs>
Uh, do you have a, a last stop for us, uh, Kieran? I do. Uh, so this is about, um, it's like a local tourism spot that wasn't as much on my radar and that I think it's a problem isn't on the radar of enough uh, uh, Bostonians. And that is uh, the Boston Harbor. And this is such a weird thing because huh. when you have tourists come to Boston, right? They yeah. hit up kind of all the, the things you'd expect. They go to the Freedom Trail. They go to Boston Common. They go to Bu- Public Gardens, Museum of Fine Art. Uh, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and but very museum. few make their way to the Boston Harbor, which is weird because when you learn about the history of America, the Boston Harbor plays a uh, a huge role in that, right? You got Boston Tea Party. It's a uh, it's a city built on uh, a, a commerce at the wharf. <laughs> yeah. And so, and what you have something to say? <laughs> no, yeah, harbors are important to commerce. Yeah, so you know, the you, harbor. You've really cracked it here, uh, Kieran. <laughs> no, but you know how uh, you know how like it, when you're in Manhattan, like very few right. people appreciate that you're surrounded by water. Yeah, the same thing has happened with Boston, where it's gotten so developed up to the waterfront that you yeah. you know you're trying to enjoy nature and you're spending time in the garden when you you know you could be uh, looking out at the Great Atlantic Ocean. But many times I have walked by what I believe to be like a replica. Tea party ship where there are grown men there, dressed there, up it, doing reenactments. Yes, that, am I that, making that up? No, that exists. Okay, um, but okay. that's not. You're not re- recommending that, are that you? That is not what I'm recommending. <laughs> no, what I'm recommending is uh, a trip uh, out to the islands in uh, Boston Harbor. So very Ooh, few people appreciate there are islands. There, there are that not only there are a ton of islands, and you've probably not heard of any of them. And they've got for, they've got very great evocative names, by the way. We've got Bumpkin Island, Button Island, Castle Island, Grape Island. Uh, Moon Island, Outer Brewster Island, Pedix Island, <laughs> Raccoon Island. Um, and there's actually, there's a local beer company that's doing their part. They put out uh, IPAs and they name them after uh, the different islands. But Ryan, I'm trying to do... <laughs> the, the world needs 14 new IPAs. <laughs> Ryan, Thank I'm God. trying to do my part. I have joined the, uh, the board of advisors of a nonprofit called Boston Harbor Now. And uh, what Boston Harbor Now is, it's a partnership with the National Park Service. Because these islands, uh, the harbor itself, is actually a national recreation area. And there is uh, the one island I would absolutely send you to. So if you're coming to Boston, put this on your list. It's called Spectacle Island. And the reason that it's called that is because from above, from the, from the sky, it looks like a pair of spectacles. Two kind of round things with a, with a slight appendage in between. And uh, it is run out uh, by this nonprofit with the National Park Service. You, you, you get on a ferry, you go out there, and you could fill an entire afternoon just doing a, a beautiful hike. You get a, views back onto the city. It actually has a small beachfront. There's a nice little picnic area there. They have Adirondacks chairs uh, sprinkled around the island. And uh, it actually, you can, you can climb up to, to quite a decent height uh, if you want to take great photographs of Boston. And I just think uh, not enough people are, are taking advantage of, of the harbor. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of uh, putting that back on the tourist map. Well, I hope that next time I'm in Boston, you can show me some of these spectacular uh, islands. Well, Ryan, you know, uh, I recently moved and uh, I, we actually just yesterday got the pullout couch with your name on it. I thought it was a guest bedroom with my name on it. And that's become well, a pullout couch. It, oh, hold on. It's a bed. <laughs> it's a room that has big yeah. TV. Okay. And, it, and it's got a, 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 bathroom, a bathroom built right in it. Yeah, private uh, So it is, a, it is a private guest room bathroom. But, yeah. you know, it didn't really make sense to just have one room with just a bed. So it's a pullout. But it's a good pullout. We invested in a good pullout. Is it king? Because sometimes there's two or three of us in bed. Uh, it does <laughs> have a separate entrance. So that's actually something I'm going to have to worry about with you. <laughs> Luckily, we do have an alarm. And oh. uh, you can't turn it off from inside that room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe it's a queen, by the way, just uh, for the That's for the fine. record. Queen of work. So, Kieran, uh, what are we talking about next week? Well, Ryan, it's very interesting to me that we haven't tackled this topic before. Um, we, we, do you remember we did the luggage throwdown where you and I oh, each yeah. designed our perfect suitcase? This is like a sequel to that, right? It, is, it does feel like a sequel to that it's because like we're going to tackle sequel. a very basic topic. I mean, so again, to get to episode yeah. 58 and not have talked about this. We're going to talk about how to pack a suitcase. I bet you and I have very different strategies about this. I think this. so, too. And, you know, yeah. I, I have tested yeah. a lot of different strategies. Uh, You've got yeah. those 
those packing cubes. You've got people who want you to roll everything. There's a lot of different philosophies on that. I mean, I would imagine that you, you know, mine doesn't involve a spreadsheet and yours <laughs> does involve a spreadsheet. Am, I, am involves, I right about that? It involves a checklist. <laughs> um, but Could I wanna, the checklist be in a spreadsheet? I, <laughs> it, yes, it can be. Um, yeah. uh, but so next week we're going to talk about how to pack a suitcase. All right. Well, I cannot wait. Until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kieran Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Is there any superhero villain whose origin story you would like to see told on film? Venom. Ooh, that's a good one. Sure, that hasn't, there hasn't been a Venom movie yet? I think there probably has. I mean, it, you can't keep track of these Marvel or comic book films because they just come out weekly. It's see, like a, I, I would like, there's a forgotten uh, a villain in the Batman universe from the old Adam West series. He was uh, the Pharaoh, and he was an Egyptologist professor who, when he got hit on the head, became an evil Pharaoh villain. I can see why that hasn't emerged. No, <laughs> no, I think it's it time sounds to like bring a, it It sounds back. like a, it's, was he a Yale professor? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if so, they're keeping all of those artifacts. <laughs> Do not come and ask. <laughs>